Horton. So grateful that you've come today. It's, uh, by the way, I know her name was Beatrice, but it's really hard for me to call her anything but B because that's what I knew her by. That's what most of you probably knew her by as well. So, um, so grateful that you've come today. I can't uh, begin to explain the importance of friends and family who gather together to encourage one another and help each other and uh, bring a little light and life to an otherwise very difficult time, especially for family members, but also for close friends and, and others. So your presence here today is greatly appreciated. And, and I wanna to say to Mike and to uh, B's family that I'm honored to be able to serve in this capacity today. This is something that a pastor never wants to do. But when the occasion arises, it is an honor to have a chance to, to speak in behalf uh, of a person that you loved and was a part of your congregation as B was here. And uh, so I'm greatly honored today, as our church is, to serve your family and to serve uh, the friends of the family as well. B. Espinosa Horton was born in South Texas on, in 1953 to Crispin and Adela Espinosa in a family of three boys and eight girls. Is that right? <laughs> these things are hard to imagine these days, aren't we, with our families of one or two or three, three kids. What a family that must have been. Her early childhood and her elementary schooling was spent on farms in the Panhandle uh, near Idaloo, Texas where she and her sister Chris helped pick crops in the fields uh, when they were very young. But the cold winters there and her father's illness uh, saw the family move some years later and relocate to Hebronville in uh, South Texas to a dairy farm of the Richardson family. And Bee's father, as well as the entire family, were employed by the Richardsons whose godly witness as Baptists provided a loving and a stable environment for that family for many years. And because of their influence, really, B and her family came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Mr. and Mrs. Richardson were very instrumental in their coming to faith. After high school, B relocated to San Antonio, attended medical assisting training program, and sub subsequently began a career with the Methodist healthcare system that spanned some 18 years. She was promoted to direct the non-invasive cardiology department of both, both Northeast and Metropolitan Methodist hospitals. In 1994, she met her husband, Michael. Michael Horton in a single Sunday school class at First Baptist Church here in San Antonio, and they were married in August of 1995. So just about 30 years together, right, Mike? What a blessing to have that long-term marriage. On April the 19th of 2024, she left the arms of her husband to be with the Lord and her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She survived by two children, Andy Cortez and Stephanie Cortez Martinez, as well as her granddaughter, Olivia Martinez. Needless to say, a, a funeral service, a memorial service, can be a very sad time. Uh, we think about the loved one that we've lost, uh, the the. The fact that that diminishes us in some sense, here is this person who's been a part of our lives and they are, are no longer with us in person, only in memory. And uh, these things make us grieve and they make us sad. But as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a different focus, don't we? That's still a part of our lives, that sadness and that grief. But there is a hopefulness that uh, that overwhelms and overcomes that grief and that sadness and there are so many places in scripture we could turn to today and we'll look at a couple one now and one later uh, so many places in scripture that we could turn to that point us to the fact that as believers in Christ we may grieve but we don't grieve as those who have no hope in fact we have a, a tremendous hope 
which is an anchor for our souls, and that is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the confidence that we have in his salvation and the eternal life that he promises. And so that's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 these very encouraging words. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. What a great word from God's word. A good word to start our service with today. So let's bow together and thank God for his unshakable and uh, unmovable love for us. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving B and uh, revealing yourself to us through this very precious family, the Richardson family, so many years ago. She placed her faith in you at that time, Father, a faith that didn't waver and Today, she is enjoying the fruit of that faith as she sits with you, as she walks with you, as she talks with you, as she is reminded that from that day so many years ago until today, she has been your own. Thank you, Father, for loving her and receiving her into your presence. And thank you for loving each one of us and providing for us a way of salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ long ago. You sent your son to die on a cross. And today that is the most meaningful thing that has ever happened in the history of the world for each of us. For through faith in Jesus and his death on the cross, we can know the same eternal life that B knows today. So Father, turn our hearts towards you today. Help us to worship you even as we remember and celebrate the the life of B. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? <laughs> there are hymnals in front of you, or some to the side of you, in the back, of the, in the bottom of the chairs, and we're going to turn to 187 in the garden. I know B loved this song, and one thing about B that just struck me as always so beautiful was her heart of worship. She loved music. She loved to sing, and she told me many times how music brought her into the presence of the Lord. And just knowing that for me, and I can only imagine how it is for you, her family, and and friends, knowing that she's worshiping forever now in the face of seeing God face to face and worshiping, and that someday we get to be there with her. It's a blessing. So this isn't a, this isn't a sad song. This is a song of joy, knowing that G, that B is where she wanted to be, and doing what she wanted to do, worshiping. Yes, in the garden, 187 in your hymnals. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on those roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with
be seated. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's hard. I know it's very, very hard. I am the uh, fourth to the eldest. Um, he was before me. Um, and of course, she was, she was the best, as always. We were real close with her. Of course, we all are. Again, there's 11 of us. Uh, she loved her two children, Andrew and Stephanie, like there was no tomorrow. Then she loved her little one, Olivia, Stephanie's little daughter. There's not much that I can say other than she's always said, if anything happens to me, please watch out for my children. I said, B, they're already grown up. And, well, watch out first for Olivia, or if nothing else, Olivia. Yes, yes, B, we will. We're a very, very close-knit family. We always got together for the holidays with her. We made it a point to get together when mom and dad were alive at a ranch uh, in Orange Grove, close to Alice, where my parents are buried. And when they passed, I decided to take on that responsibility of making sure the family comes together, whoever can. Not everybody can, everybody's everywhere else. The three boys are in law enforcement down South Texas, and the rest of us are pretty much everywhere. But whenever she could, we would make it a point to get together with her for our holidays, whether it be Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever. We would also make sure that she would get together with my sister Mimi. They were real, real close to get together once a week to go have breakfast and go to the movies and do heaven knows what. I don't know. They were bad out there, but I'm telling you. But I would get together at least twice a month for breakfast because she loved the restaurant Mia's, which is just really close to where she's at, off of 1604. She said, that was the best, best place, Chris. And I was always trying to, because I'm diabetic, I'd always try to watch what I eat. She goes, the tortillas are the best. Go Okay, well, I would eat tortillas every time, and not just one. She goes, take, take just one. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'd take three. I know, I'm telling everybody. I would eat three, and then take a dozen home for my family. But let's not tell them, okay? But pretty much, and afterwards, we would go to James Avery. She loved James Avery. Oh, my God. The woman was, I mean, here it is, all James Avery. All of the stuff that we have is James Avery. She would love it. That was her favorite place. Plus, Bath and Body Works. We would always get little creams here and there. But that was her favorite thing. I want to make sure that I give thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, I appreciate everyone's effort to make it. Again, always remember her. She was the best. Um, what else can I say other than we'll miss her dearly now and forever. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mimi. I'm the baby out of the eight girls in the family. <laughs> um, so yeah, my older sisters always made sure that I was well taken care of growing up. Um, B and I over the years became extremely close. <sighs> she was my partner in crime, <laughs> but most of all, she was my best friend. I would sneak off on the weekends, come visit her. I always had an excuse. I told my husband that I was gonna take B to run her errands and go pick up her prescriptions. And, but we all, always managed to go have something to eat. Luby's was our special place. 
we always walked in is, I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna try something different. Hey, that looks good, that looks good. What happens? We always chose the same thing. <laughs> Never tried anything different. And from there, I asked her, or she would ask me, is there anything else that you wanna do? She goes, I don't wanna keep you from home. You know, take care of your family, take care of Bill. I said, B, I've got it until 4.30. What can we do? Let's go to the movies. So we pretty much watched everything new that was out there. That was how we spent our time. Big tub of popcorn. I would sneak in pickles, which I know I shouldn't have done. <laughs> but that's what we ate. My big drink. And we stay until the end. And then she says, you want to sit for the next round? I said, no. It's time for me to go home. When we were young, she didn't know how to, I think most of us didn't know how to ride any, a bicycle. She wanted me to teach her. I didn't know how. She wanted me to teach her. So we had a, a straight road at the old ranch with Richardson. Had a big bike. She couldn't even reach the, the ground. She got on it. She says, okay, time for you to teach me. Wouldn't, she says, don't let me go, don't let me go. She could, she could not get the handle. She couldn't get a handle on it. She just didn't know how. She, she fell several times, scraped her elbows and scraped her knees, but uh, she finally gave up. And she says, well, one of these days, she says, I will learn to ride a bike. Here it is all these years later. And we, we never learned, but we gave it a try. She was my best friend, and I will keep her in my heart forever. Always. I want to thank everybody for coming in today. Knowing that she is now with our Heavenly Father. And that she is now healthy and safe. And she is with Mom and Dad. Again, thank you for coming. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. It's really nice to have uh, you all here to be with me in memory and celebration of Bee's life. Um, she had a full life. Uh, and in her growing up, there was uh, experiences that a lot of people nowadays don't have. Um, she knew how, from a very early age, how to work hard, how to uh, scrimp and save and do without. Um, the times were rough for people that uh, went from place to place picking crops and things. Still is, too, for that matter. Uh, but in spite of it all and through it of all, uh, those experiences gave her something to give to her children that could never be taken away by a slick salesman or the tax man or anything like that. These are qualities of the spirit. These are qualities of a sense of moral direction and uh, a resiliency that comes from uh, living in and through hard, hard times. And so um, I felt blessed to be her husband and uh, be part of her family. Uh, I only had a brother, but she had 11. <laughs> in her family. And it was amazing to, to see um, a family of so many that had such 
diverse differences in personality. You know, when you only have one brother, you're pretty much the same, you know, uh, like your brother or like your sisters. But when you have a large family, as, as did my family's fa my father, they, they came from a big family too. You have a lot of different personalities in a family and, and that always makes for a, a lot of interesting and wonderful memories looking back. Uh, but uh, my memories in looking back were, were wonderful with thee. She was a wonderful woman. And for a little while, I'll miss her. But in another little while, I'll see her again. And so, because of my Savior, I have a peace that goes beyond understanding, especially from people outside the relationship, outside of the marriage. Even in, the, even in her family, nobody, nobody is close to one another. As two Christians who are married to each other that know the Lord's love, that have that binding force, that no matter whether times keep them together or times pull them apart for a while or however things go, he holds the relationships together that presence of God in, in the relationship. And for that, I thank my Savior, the source of love, godly love, that is a whole lot different than what passes for love in uh, our society's uh, expression today. So I thank you for the God's love that's in your heart that brought you here today to share this memory with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. be a little musical interlude here. I heard a song on a Christian radio station that, you know, about a week after she passed on to be with the Lord, I just hit me like a, you know, somebody ringing a bell. I thought, wow, see, this is a really nice song. I got to looking it up. Uh, the song is called Flee, like you flee and run away. It says, flee as a bird. Flee as a bird to the mountain is the title. And it uh, is a song, it's actually kind of old. It was uh, around maybe at or just before the Civil War. And uh, that's kind of nice, it's in a minor key, but it, it has a really uplifting uh, uh, set of words and I, I'd like to share that with you. Oh, oh, oh. 
Thank you, Mike. Uh, I know you really wanted to uh, give that as a gift in honor of your uh, wife, and I know that uh, it meant much to us and to you and, and to her if she is looking down from heaven, recognizing your contribution to the service. I know you loved her very much, and I, as others, of course, in the family did, and no doubt the loss of a loved one is one of the most difficult, one of the most painful experiences of life. And, and uh, I know she loved you too, Mike. Um, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, and normally I wouldn't share what people say to me when they come forward, sometimes at the end of a worship service to have me pray for them or whatever. But uh, on many occasions, when you were going through some health issues of your own, a B would come forward and just ask me to pray for you. Pray for Mike. Pray that he'll get better. Pray that he'll be strengthened by the Lord. That conversation and those prayers took place many times as she expressed her love for you to me. And you know, those that uh, we love, those that love us, uh, <clears throat> in a way, define our very existence, don't they? I mean, some of you, you sisters, grew up with her virtually all your life and so B's always been a part of who you are and for Mike B's been a part of what um, he is for these many years and to the children uh, they've never known until recently what it is to be without B in their life so whether it is because they care for us 
or they fill our daily existence with conversation and companionship, or because we provide care for them, the people that we love become very much a part of our own lives. Uh, and so when we lose them to death, it, it seems like a part of us dies. And that kind of loss is always painful. But it, it's with this kind of uh, pain and the difficulty of death in mind <clears throat> that the Bible uh, communicates these words to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. Let me share the text with you. The scripture says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable <clears throat> inherit, the king, uh, inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So God never denied the valid, painful emotions that we experience at death in his word, but he does encourage us to see that regarding that which is ultimate, that which is eternal, the death of a believer in Christ is somehow not loss, but rather it is gain. It, it's, it, it's not defeat, it's victory. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a great German pastor and theologian and author who was martyred for his faith by the Nazi regime. And he said it this way, death is the supreme festival on the road to freedom. What a statement. How can such a thing be? Our experience of death doesn't seem like that at all. And yet Bonhoeffer was trying to express what Paul was expressing in 1 Corinthians 15. Death, the supreme festival on the road to victory. So what has God done to, uh, to take the sting out of death? What has God done to make death actual victory for us? He did something in the past, he does something in the present, and he will do something in the future for everyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In the past, God sent Christ to die in our place. The Bible makes it clear that the greatest tragedy regarding death would be for someone to die as one whose life has been lived in opposition to God. And according to God, this is the position that we all find ourselves in at some point. The Bible says there's no one who is righteous, not even one, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death, that is, the death of eternal separation from God. But the Bible goes on to say that God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were enemies, God's enemies, the Bible says, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Somehow in God's eternal wisdom and God's eternal plan, Christ died as a substitute for each of us, taking the penalty of our sin upon himself. And so when he died, he took the sting of death on our behalf. Stories told of a father and son who were driving on a country road in a beautiful spring afternoon. 
The weather was wonderful outside. It hadn't grown too hot just yet. And so as they drove down this country road, they rolled down the windows to enjoy the fresh air and the breeze coming in. Well, about that time, a bumblebee, a big black and yellow bumblebee, flew, not, not our bee, by the way, uh, flew through the window and began to buzz around wildly in the car. Well, uh, the little boy that was with his father was scared to death, not just because bees are frightening, but because he had a particular allergy to bees and the sting of that bee could have cost him his life. And so the little boy began to squirm and wiggle and try to dodge the bee. And about that time, the father reached out with his big old hand and just grabbed the bee right out of the air. Well, the boy calmed down now because he knew that the bee was in the father's hand and he didn't have anything to be afraid of. And then the father did something that stunned him. He turned his hand open like this and released the bee. And the bee began to fly around in the car again. Well, the little boy was again scared to death. And he said, Dad, what have you done? And the father turned his hand to his son. And in the middle of his hand was a big red bulge from the sting of the bee. And he said to his son, Son, you don't have to worry. That bee can't hurt you anymore. Its sting is gone. And in the same way, 2,000 years ago, our Lord Jesus Christ willingly allowed his hands to be stretched out on a cross and nails to be driven in his hands as if to say to us with those scars in his hands, you don't have to worry about death anymore. Its sting is gone. See, it's right there in my hand. We still physically die, don't we? But the sting, the eternal separation from our loving Heavenly Father is gone. If we, like B, have accepted the gift of salvation and placed our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what God did in the past to make it possible for the sting of death to be gone. But there's something that he does in the present, particularly at the moment of death, when a person of faith dies in the Lord, he sends his angels to carry us home. Jesus told a parable on one occasion about a rich man and a poor man. The, the rich man, uh, uh, we don't know for sure his name, but the poor man, the poor beggar's name was Lazarus. And Lazarus laid outside the rich man's home and, and, and just desired to eat the scraps from the rich man's table. And Jesus mentioned something in that parable that's important for us today. He said the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of what, what's going on in the realm that we can't see when all we can observe is the death of a loved one. You know, there are about 300 references to angels in the scriptures and Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says something very important. It says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit eternal salvation? I heard of a little, little boy named Kenny who developed leukemia. And the disease progressed rapidly regardless of the attempts of doctors to help him with his health. Soon he was unable to go to school, then unable to go outside of his home at all, and finally he was confined to his bed. And one day he asked this question of his mother. He said, Mom, what's it like to die? And at first she couldn't answer. But then she said, as if guided by the Spirit of God, she said, Kenny, you remember how you were when you were a very little fellow. You sometimes would fall asleep in my bed. And how the next morning when you would awaken, you would find yourself in your own bed and in your own room. Did you know how that happened? That happened because while you were sleeping, your big brother came or your father came and he lifted you up and he carried you so gently to your own bed and your own room. That, Kenny, is what death is like. The youngster smiled and he understood. A few weeks later, he fell asleep and he was carried 
by God's angels to heaven. And I don't know what B saw in the moments before she passed away. But I do know that the Bible says that whether we see them or not, God has sent his angels to care for us and to carry us home at the time of our death. And he did that for her. And for that, we give him praise. But there's something in the future that God has for each of us that name the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is God has told us of a coming heavenly home. Jesus said in John chapter 14 that he was going to prepare a place for us. That's a power-packed statement, isn't it? How could he possibly describe the, glo describe the glory of heaven that God has prepared for those who love him? The Bible says, eye has not seen nor ear has heard the things that God has prepared for those who are his followers. In the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, an analogy for life, really, C.S. Lewis concludes by talking about the characters in his story and how they were fearful of what would happen to them at death. And he goes on to describe uh, what they learned after they experienced what heaven was ultimately like, what their future was like. And here's how he, he, he captures it in the way that only C.S. Lewis could. He said, all their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Though we cannot see heaven, we trust God's word that B is there in the presence of God. She has begun the first chapter of real life, the book of life that goes on forevermore. And whatever that is, though I can't describe it to you, and the Bible giving its best attempt can't even do it justice because we can't comprehend it. Whatever it is, it's bound to be good. And that's where B is, and that's what she's experiencing today. And for that, we rejoice. So I leave you with hope today. Hope that is inspired by the past, the present, and the future. In the past, God sent Christ to die in our place, to pay the penalty for our sin. In the present, God sends his angels to minister to us and ultimately to carry us home. And in the future, God has prepared a place for us, a heavenly home for those who name Jesus as their Lord. I'm so glad that B expressed her faith in Jesus Christ and we can celebrate today, even in the midst of our tears, tears, God's provision for her and taking her to be with him in that glorious heavenly home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done for us and specifically what you've done for B in providing her with a heavenly home and receiving her there into your presence and letting her begin what we've referred to as chapter one in the story of real life. We thank you that we can commit her to you. And we thank you, Father, that you're committed to us and that you love us. You love everyone in this room and you've provided a way of salvation for every person so that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I pray, Father, that we've all done that and that we can have confidence as B had confidence in her future and in her life with you. So bless this family. Bless these friends, Father. Draw them close to you. Help them to experience your grace and your peace and your love. And I pray, the Father, that you would comfort them in their grief, wipe away their tears, and fill their lives with joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that your hearts were comforted by that message as, as mine was. 
Brother Doug is such a, such a blessing to our church, and I know he is to you. And uh, just those words that we needed to hear today, the Lord has a way of giving our hearts what we need in sad times and in glad times. And it's a joy to hear what the Lord had to say to us this morning. So would you get your hymnals one more time and turn to number 334. We'll stay seated as we sing. And what a great, what a great song to end. Just exactly what Brother Doug was talking about, the blessed assurance that we have when we know Jesus. Number 334. Let's pray together as we conclude this service today. Heavenly Father, we pray that your grace and your peace may rest upon each person that has been a part of this service today, especially upon these, fa this, these family members and, and, of course, on friends as well. And just pray, Father, that they would sense your presence as we leave this place. They would know of your love for them and they would respond to your love in the ways that you lead them to do so comfort and encourage and strengthen each one. And we thank you again for Bee and the influence that she's had upon all of our lives. Thank you for receiving her to yourself and for the great hope that we have in Christ Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're wel welcome to stay for a while and visit with one another and encourage each other and especially encourage this family.